This episode is sponsored by Masterclass. Though it is really important to know stuff, Masterclass's world-famous instructors show you how to do what's important to you. When I set out to prepare for this podcast almost exactly one year ago, I knew in April 2020 that I needed to get better at writing. That's where one of my favorite authors, Malcolm Gladwell, came in. Masterclass makes it possible for me and others wanting to improve their writing to take a class from Malcolm Gladwell on writing at our own pace. You can watch and in many cases listen to awesome instructors like Malcolm Gladwell teach you how to do what's important to you. You want to be a better cook? Gordon Ramsay teaches you how on the Masterclass platform. You want to learn how to act? Natalie Portman teaches you on the Masterclass platform. Grow yourself and support Forgotten Wars by trying Masterclass for the year using the link in our show notes. Learn how to do what's important to you from the experts. Now, to our episode. This is Forgotten Wars. Those of you who listened to episode 1.1 months ago, or who listened to its rebroadcast earlier this week, were left with a bitter taste in your mouth. Colonel Baden Powell coolly and efficiently used desperate blacks in and around Mafeking to great effect. He used Baralong, Shangon, Fingos, Shidi, and other blacks to fortify and sometimes defend the black and white Mafeking that sat side by side. Ironically, the Boers, along with the Baralong, besieged the Shidi of Mafeking for two of the early years of the 1880s. Now the Shidi and Baralong had to work with other blacks and the British to hold off and make kicks at the Boer besiegers outside Mafeking. But if any of those Baralong, Shangon, Fingos, Shidi, and other blacks delivered poor intelligence reports, they were severely punished, and sometimes firing squads would take their places and shoot down blacks suspected of working both war and British sides. Even if you didn't deliver poor intelligence to Baden Powell, and even if you had done valuable work at Mafeking for BP weeks ago, your black life didn't necessarily matter. If you didn't leave, and you could not afford to fill a price-gouging soup kitchen's pockets, you dug for dead horse, dug for dead dog, grasped for locusts. You heard that right. Locusts. The Sheedy chief vocally expressed his outrage at Baden Powell's ruthless rationing of food and disrespect towards Baralong leadership. That chief vessels even started discouraging his Sheedy from helping the British in Moffa Kang's defense. The Times correspondent Angus Hamilton reported vessels saying that BP wanted to make starving slaves of the blacks. So, that Sheedy chief was sacked by Baden Powell. By the way, the Moffa Kang censor usually tossed the Times correspondent Angus Hamilton's reports into the trash rather than transmit those heartbreaking reports to Hamilton's sub-editor. But blacks were far more than simple victims during this South African war. There was a lot more going on around Moffa King and across Southern Africa during this war. Under the British flag, you will have everything you desire. But that flag will continue to fly over the land. Over the land, maybe. Over the people, never. You will see me in the field, fighting for our independence, long after you and your party who make war with your mouths have fled the country. I don't think the Boers will have a chance. Disarm your blacks. Act the part of a white man in a white man's war. Civilized war is awful. I don't claim to be giving you the comprehensive and clear view of what black Africans did during the South African War of 1899 to 1902. 
To allude a bit to Paul, my goal throughout has been to help you see through the glass less darkly and to know the seen more fully. For you to come close to fully knowing and fully seeing the seen will require reading many books. We will revisit how blacks engaged in and were affected by the war towards the end of the season. But for this episode, I'll start by giving you some estimates. Historian Andrew Porter estimates that as many as 40,000 Africans took up arms in some capacity for the British. Porter estimates that between 100,000 and 120,000 blacks and coloreds supported the British war effort in at least some way. All that said, I want to share one of my favorite stories of blacks taking their destinies into their own hands during this war. But before I share that, you have a few other aspects of black people and the South African war to hear about. Despite Cecil Rhodes' legislation before the Anglo Boer War that sought to further marginalize more blacks in the Cape Colony by even further limiting which blacks could vote, there still existed a black elite in the Cape Colony. These mission educated blacks often possessed significant political consciousness. These blacks met the increasingly steep property holding and tax requirements to have the right to vote in the Cape Colony. Other blacks far outnumbered these voting blacks, but these voting blacks still had significant enough numbers for politicians to make overtures to these voting blacks in 17 of the Cape Colony's districts. Some of this Cape black elite hoped that even these limited voting rights would be extended to the blacks in the Free State and the Transvaal if the British won preeminence in all of Southern Africa. British Secretary Joseph Chamberlain fed these hopes, but, not surprisingly, not all blacks thought the same. Some dissenters criticized the British for being too pushy with the Boers before the Anglo-Boer War. For example, John Tango Chabavu, editor of the Imbuza Ban Sundu paper in King Williamstown, criticized the British for their forceful attempt to make the Transvaal as liberal as any utopia. Chabavu's stand against the war cost him a lot of influence and his newspaper's profitability. Black elites, Cape leaders, and British administrators debated whether to arm blacks in the Cape Colony to fight invading wars. This strikes me as ironic because before the war, some war agents had tried to stir up blacks within the Cape Colony enough to rise up against the Cape Colony. These war attempts proved fruitless. Once war began, once the wars drove deeper into the Cape Colony, and once these wars started stripping blacks of their remaining rights and land, aiding the British and raiding rebel Afrikaner farms grew more and more appealing. What also grew more appealing to blacks during this South African war was working for the British Army, not only as scouts or horse suppliers, but also as oxen drivers, as blacksmiths, and in a variety of unskilled labor jobs. The British paid far better wages than most of these blacks had ever seen, but better wages did not always mean better treatment. Bill Nassen notes the following about how some British treated these black contractors. Quote, it was inevitable that British troopers would seize opportunities to assert their muscle over those even lower in the army pecking order, and the actions of Tommies at camps ranged from beating and stabbing of laborers to the forcible drowning of an African mule driver in a pig trough at Greenpoint Camp in October 1901. I find this next part less dark. Black mule drivers resorted to indirect verbal retaliation, yelling Englishmen at their animals when whipping them. But as the war progressed, Tommies and blacks became increasingly involved in close personal relationships. Tommies were far more inclined than the officer elite to view blacks as fellow men, hostile and devious perhaps, but nonetheless inhabitants of a recognizable world. More than one soldier saw analogies between black laborers and Irish navvies, 
and between malnourished black children and Glaswegian urchins. End quote. Warwick contends this about Australians and Afrikaners serving in British forces alongside black workers. Quote, Colonial troops, especially Australians, seem to have played a prominent part in some of the day-to-day violence directed against black workers, while the high-handedness and cruelty of poor white, often Afrikaner, overseers, frequently became sources of protest, desertion, and even violence. End quote. I mentioned before that British political leadership officially banned British generals from the beginning from using non-white troops against the Boers during this South African war. For example, Secretary of War Broderick denied Kitchener's request for Indian cavalry regiments in January of 1901 for fear that this would appear as a confession of weakness to the Boers, even to the world. Kitchener complained, quote, If only we had some native troops who could for one moment forget their stomachs and go for the enemy. End quote. But from the war's beginning, British leadership did officially allow for black scouts and dispatch riders as long as those scouts and riders were not armed. But wars killed these unarmed blacks in alarming numbers to where in December 1900, Lord Roberts officially decided that black scouts who already owned rifles could use them. Kitchener showed much more flexibility and, when pressed, evasiveness when it came to how much he allowed blacks to be armed in 1901. As you may have guessed, though, what was officially allowed and what was actually practiced often looked very different. You may recall the letter written on Cronier's behalf that accused Colonel Baden-Powell of arming blacks at Mafeking and urging BP to, quote, act the part of a white man in a white man's war. What you didn't hear before was this from the pen of Baden-Powell to Pete Cronier, or American surgeon John Dyer, if you want to get technical, writing on behalf of Baden-Powell to Pete Cronier. Quote, The natives are becoming extremely incensed at your stealing of their cattle and the wanton burning of their crawls. You thought it fit to carry on cattle thefts and raids against them, and you are now beginning to feel the consequences. Please do not suppose that I am ignorant of what you have been doing with regard to seeking assistance of armed natives. End quote. BP later wrote Sneeman, threatening to allow the Basutu to join the war if Sneeman didn't stop arming blacks against the Mafeking garrison. BP even audaciously claimed that he had the moral high ground because he had refused Barlong requests to become troops in his garrison. BP totally lied here. What appears more truthful is that both sides fighting over Mafeking armed blacks as it suited them. The Boers used Rapulana Baralong not only as scouts and messengers around Mafeking. The Boers armed these Rapulana to raid cattle, to guard cattle, and to man war trenches and fortifications around Mafeking. Some of these Rapulana reportedly started executing Shidi enemies outside Mafeking at such an alarming rate that the Boers threatened to disarm these Rapulana completely. Mafeking is only part of the picture. The Nguatu kingdom lived an unstable existence for its first 30 years. Then Kama III emerged as king in 1875. He solidified his rule through revolutions of sorts. He closely regulated trade, but opened up private property more. Kama III also embraced Christianity, which no doubt won him more favor from British administrators in the region. Those administrators helped Kama III stay in power through more than one challenge to his rule. One of those challenges from his own son. Kama III established himself as a somewhat authoritarian ruler with a rock-solid loyalty to the British. War and British both saw Kama III as the most dependable British ally of all Swane leaders in Southern Africa. When our South African war broke out, Kama focused on protecting his kingdom's territory 
and blocking any war attempts to turn discontented parts of Kama's kingdom against him. Kama received reports in mid-October 1899 that General F.A. Hrobler was leading a large war force to occupy the Nguatu capital as part of an effort to keep Lieutenant Colonel Plumer's Rhodesians isolated and pinned down along the Rhodesian frontier. So Kama sent a force to occupy Nwape to block this war advance. General Hrobler wrote Kama a letter saying, quote, As you live beyond our boundary, I have thought it good to warn you against taking part in the conflict between us and the English. And if you are not satisfied with this, you must take the consequences. Further, I wish to inform you that, as you have allowed the English to use your ground for warlike operations, we shall also use it for that purpose, but without disturbing you, unless you help the enemy. End quote. Kama replied, quote, If you do not intend to fight me, what are you doing in my country with an armed force? If you enter with armed men into my country and among my cattle posts, I shall fight you. You must not think that you can frighten me and my people with your war talk. You know that I am the son of the White Queen. End quote. Kama ballooned his defense force so that Hrobler's men eventually decided against trying to take Nwape. This was the most substantial resistance that Kama's Nguatu had to mount against the Boers. Their kingdom remained safe. Basuto land was wedged between Natal, the Orange Free State, and the Cape Colony. We will get into this in a later episode, but let's just say that the Free Staters mauled the Basutos in the past. The good news for the remaining Basuto, as storm clouds of the Anglo-Boer War gathered, was that British administrators badly wanted to maintain the Basuto's loyalty by swiftly defeating the Boers. Once war was underway, the Basuto were not to attack the Orange Free State, but the British did authorize the Basuto to defend their territory. The British employed Basuto scouts. These scouts provided valuable intelligence to Lord Roberts as he rolled his large force into the Orange Free State in February 1900. Basuto forces clashed with De Vett's wars a couple times to try to block a war invasion of Basuto land. What may have been just as important is that the Basuto supplied some horses to the British. They sold 4,400 horses to the British armed forces in the year 1900 alone. They sold 15,000 more horses in 1901. Sutu horse sales saddled Sutu nobles with lots of money, but drove up horse prices. Other Basutos left their land at twice the rate they had before the Anglo-Boer War, selling the best of their flocks to the Brits and unwittingly importing diseased cattle from elsewhere in southern Africa dramatically depleted Suto horse stock. Zululand proved an interesting front of the war. The Boers invaded Zululand along with the neighboring Natawal, but were much more disciplined about how they invaded Zululand, meaning the Boers didn't loot Zululand the way they looted Natawal. The Boers didn't want to push the Zulus here into fighting for the British. The Boers even cut the taxes in Zululand in half, a real godsend to a people recently made destitute by famine and disease. Yet as the Boers continued to recede from the towel, some Zulu raided Boer cattle on behalf of British military leaders, with those Zulu getting to keep 10% of the cattle they stole in some cases. Speaking of Zululand, Swaziland sat snugly between the Transvaal and Zululand. In episode 1.17, you heard about how the British let the Boers have their way with Swaziland just short of letting the Boers put a puppet ruler over Swaziland. Once war engulfed southern Africa, the Boers gave the Swazis their independence back in exchange for the Swazis promising to sit this war out. The Swazi tried to sit this one out, but when a British force tasked with sealing the border between the Transvaal 
and Mozambique devoted at least as much time gun running to Mozambique and looting Swazi homesteads as well as abandoned white property, the Swazi started to reach their boiling point. Warwick writes this about what that unit did to push the Swazi over the edge. Quote, When the unit in prison Prince Matsibane Klamini on suspicion of war sympathies, this was the final straw for the Swazi Council. La Botsi Beni contacted General Buta through Thijs Grobler and informed him that a group of British robbers were operating in Swaziland without her consent. On July 21st, 1901, the Ermelo Commando, led by Tobias Smuts, crossed the Swazi border and surrounded Bremersdorp, where the British unit was operating. The commando soon overpowered the unit, took 41 prisoners, captured a haul of firearms, seized 400 cattle and 50 horses, liberated Matsi Bane, and incinerated the town, thereby ending Bremersdorp's period as the administrative capital of Swaziland. Tobias Smuts was given an audience by Labotsi Beni before an assembly of the Swazi Council and thanked for his efforts. In return, Smuts presented the Queen Regent with some of the seized cattle. End quote. As the war continued, the Swazis stayed relatively safe by playing the British and the Boers off of each other. The end of the war didn't treat them too kindly, though. Now I'll take you a little further back in time. The year was 1869. The man, Kamanyane, chief of the Katla tribe in southern Africa. I say Katla and Kamanyane, but know that there is a click at the beginning of both those names that I just have no shot of accurately pronouncing. Just wanted to have all my cards on the table. Now back to our narrative. The crime? Refusal to provide laborers demanded for Boer farms. Boer farms composed largely of former Katla land. The punishment? A public flogging by a Boer field cornet, Paul Creer, at least according to Katla witnesses. The consequence? Kamanyane flees Boer rule with many of his people to Botswana. There were other options for a ruler being so degraded like a criminal or a slave in front of his people. But Kamanyane's option would prove the right one. Thirty years later, on the eve of the Boer War, the Katla people stood 30,000 strong. The British had just granted the Katla their own reserve within the Bechuana land protectorate. Seven years earlier, the succeeding chief Lynchwe converted to the Christianity of the Reformed Church. This conversion caused the British to fear that the Katla would sympathize with the Katla's brethren in religion, the Boers. The British could not have been more mistaken. The Transvaal would try unsuccessfully to undercut Lynchwe's authority by supporting cousin and rival Mokai Mosulaketsi. Though Mosulaketsi's power play imploded, threats to the survival of the Katla did not. From 1896 to 1897, the Rinderpest epizootic wiped out 90% of the bedrock of the Katla economy, their cattle. Lynchway's rule was further threatened by a rival who wanted to westernize Katla culture and education. This rival was Lynchway's Anglophile half-brother, Sigale. Their rivalry would take an unexpected turn. On October 25, 1899, Rustenberg and Mariko commandos demanded Lynchway's support against the British. The British encouraged Katla to defend against the Boer incursions, since the Katla reserve straddled a 100-kilometer stretch of railway that could help link support to Boer-besieged Mafeking. Lynchway saw little he could do to stop the Boers, at that point thinking the Boers would win the war. But Lynchway also knew that Boer victory portended a terrible future for Katla. One of Lynchway's messenger spies said Lynchway's goal early on was to blind the Dutch by making it appear he sympathized with the Boers. Lynchway did lay low for a time, but another Boer insult would cause the Katla to stand up. 
children and the elderly of Katla villages were nearly run over by the Rustenberg Commando's mounted men. Cattle of the Katla Reserve were raided by the same commando. Lynchway asked the commando leader to make this stop. Commando leader Hendrik Riekert, quote, picked up a handful of dirt and said that the dirt was cleaner than the chief of the Katla, then threw this handful of dirt into the air and said that the little stone falling was bigger than the chief of Katla, end quote. Half-brother Sigale would not stand for this. He and his followers joined British forces in a surprise attack on November 8th against Rikert's commando. This placed the Katla in danger of looking like official British supporters. With little choice after his half-brother's actions, Lynchway led the Katla to the British side after making a request for more rifles. Days later, Mokai and two wars, unaware that the Katla had taken the British side, were captured passing through Katla territory. Hendrik Riekert's son, Hans, was one of the three men captured and turned over to the British. This virtual declaration of war brought war troops to Derdepert to completely take their gloves off against the Katla. Ironically, it was the British who were used as a pawn in the first major clash between war and Katla. In the Battle of Derdepert, wars used three giant stone slabs to form a triangular lahar. The Katla, and really the Katla alone, attacked this position. Why Katla did the majority of the dying here has been explained differently through time. Rhodesia was a colony established by British men. Colonel J. Holdsworth's mounted Rhodesians white Rhodesians, and a Maxim machine gun were supposed to attack a war commando Lahar near Derdepert. Lynchway did not trust Holdsworth's 100 men and machine gun to have the firepower or the will to overcome the Derdepert Lahar. After all, Holdsworth's main mission was to help relieve the war besieged town of Mafeking, not protect the Katla. Lynchway feared that merely remaining behind with Katla to defend their reserve in the event of a failed Holdsworth attack would in fact make the reserve more vulnerable to war retaliation. What Lynchway and Sigale both knew was that there was another commando near Gaborones that, if left undisturbed, could easily retaliate against the Katla reserve after Holdsworth's men moved on. On November 24th, 1899, Sigale used the cover of darkness not just to help the British maneuver into a position south of the Derdepert Lahar as requested. He used darkness to trick Holdsworth into ordering Katla regiments to occupy a ridge overlooking the enemy Lahar. Based on Sigale's intelligence, Holdsworth thought this ridge was still within the protectorate border, but the ridge was in Transvaal territory. As darkness turned to dawn, Lynchway's brother, Romano, led the attack from the ridge on the war Lahar. It was only then that Holdsworth realized his troops were in Transvaal territory. The Rhodesians began firing their rifles and Maxim until Holdsworth realized his and Romano's regiments were in danger of firing through the Lahar at each other. Holdsworth realized his mounted men would not be able to cross the river between them and the Lahar safely. So Holdsworth ordered a full retreat. No Rhodesian troops perished. Fourteen charging Katla men died. Sixteen were maimed. But before the Katla retreated to safety, they managed to kill at least 20 of the commando. The Katla also captured 130 cattle and 18 women and children whom they transferred to British custody. This skirmish caused consternation in all quarters. South African Republic President Paul Creer accused the British of intentionally violating the Gentleman's Agreement, that white man's war agreement. British officers and protectorate officials distrusted each other after this. Sermon and Ralph Williams, the resident commissioner, thought Holdsworth had used Katla to do his fighting and had betrayed them by retreating early. From one report, quote, Lynchway asked Holdsworth, how many men he had killed, and how many wounded, 
and Holdsworth had to reply, none, at which Lynchway told him he had 14 men killed and 16 wounded and told him that Colonel Holdsworth had gone not to fight, but to see a fight, that when a native chief went with another chief to battle, they won together or fell together, but that no one ever abandoned the other in the field. End quote. Just as the Katla had feared, Holdsworth's retreat invited war retaliation against Katla villages, followed by both sides attacking each other's towns until January 1st, 1900. With a high tide of British reinforcements washing over South Africa, the Katla drove boars out of the Katla-dense Salzpert and then began driving livestock from defenseless boar farms towards the Katla Reserve. With the British authorization and more British rifles, the Katla drove the boars all the way back to Pretoria. With an estimated 20% of their fighting male population dying during these raids and clashes, the Katla paid a high price. But with this high price came a rich reward. The Katla's herd, previously decimated by the Rinder Pest epizootic, increased 10 times over by 1904, standing at 16,000. The Katla had helped defeat the Boers. The Katla in the reserve and the Katla in Salzpert grew more united and powerful. The Katla were economically strong enough to even bend British authority more to their benefit after the war. When the new nation of Botswana eventually emerged from the Bechuanaland Protectorate, the Katla tribe was a force to be reckoned with, not marginalized. So I have good news and a request. The good news for those of you awesome listeners who immediately listen to current episodes, from now on until the end of this season, I will release episodes at least twice a week. Now for some context. I've now spent nearly $2,000 and well over 2,000 hours getting this show up and running, but have not made a single dollar yet. My request is that you would share episode 1.3 on your social media platforms, especially if you're someone who can't buy from the show or support the show in any myriad of financial ways. Sharing that episode on your preferred platform or via email would really increase the odds that this show can go on. In the show notes, I'll put a simple tagline you can use when sharing. All right, that's all for this week. Take care.